Hi, I'm Ethan Jackson. I'm the founder and CEO of um, Kelda. We're a, a developer tools company focused on containers and, and development of containers. And today I'm actually going to talk about um, a particular set of problems I've noticed that people experience when they're adopting containers over time. And then uh, Blimp, which is a new service that we launched uh, that addresses those problems by allowing you to run Docker Compose in the, in the cloud. Let's start off and talk a little bit about uh, a particular developer productivity challenge that I've noticed most teams run into uh, when they're adopting containers, but may be a little bit uh, not quite on the radar when you're first starting. Um, so when most companies start off with containers, they tend to start off pretty small. Um, you might have ambitions to have a massive microservice architecture with thousands of nodes, but day one, you're gonna take your monolith, you're gonna wrap it in a container, and you're gonna put it in production, or even if you're starting Greenfield, you're gonna have one or two containers from the start. Um, it's not going to be a huge number of containers day one. And from the development perspective, for, for, for a developer, this is, this is good. Uh, if you've got two or three containers, it's easy to run it on a laptop, um, and the development experience is great. Uh, because Docker is so great and so easy to use um, and really does make the, the experience of running things in production so much better, there's this natural trend over time to have more and more containers. Um, you end up taking more and more of your legacy infrastructure and moving it to this new way of doing things. Um, you add new functionality to your system that, that before containers you might have um, built into your monolith, but now you, uh, now you create a new container for it. So teams that adopt containers, they tend to start small, and then there's ever increasing number of containers over time. Um, and like logically, as you add more containers, those containers are gonna require more resources. Um, obviously, this is the case when you scale out a particular service with more instances uh, to service more demand. But obviously also as you add more functionality at, with new containers, those are all gonna have kind of a minimal amount of overhead that they need to run. So more containers require more RAM and CPU to run in production. So this trend toward more containers in production is fine. We add more containers, they require more resources, and we just boot more uh, VMs or servers to, to handle those resources. Um, and of course, the additional, uh, the additional resources have a cost associated with it, but that cost is, is presumably worth it because you're either adding new features that your users are going, going to find delightful, or you're adding more users <laughs> um, who are going to result in revenue that can kind of pay for the, pay for the server. For the developer working on their laptop, the situation is a bit more complicated. And to really drill into that, let's first get on the same page about how developers tend to work with containers on their laptops. So, um, and I, I've over the past year, I've probably talked to 200 different engineering teams uh, that are running containers in production. Um, and the pattern I've seen, and I know this isn't super scientific, uh, but the pattern I've seen is the vast majority are using Mac or Windows laptops for development. And they're using, the developers are using Docker Compose to boot their containers on their laptop. Uh, they boot the containers, sometimes they boot the container that they're actually working on. Uh, sometimes they just boot the dependencies of the code that they need, um, that, that, that the code that they're working on needs to, to be tested. So they boot that on their laptop using Docker Compose. Interestingly, um, this is a bit counterintuitive, um, but interestingly, even for teams that are using Kubernetes in production, 
Um, you would think that most of them would be using Minikube, and some of them do, uh, but, but the vast majority actually still use Docker Compose, um, in my experience, for development. And I think this is because um, Kubernetes is so complicated, um, and appropriately so. Run, running containers in production is complicated, and you need a complicated system to do it. Uh, but in my experience as a developer, uh, I, I just want something to like get the containers up and go. Um, and Docker Compose is uh, much easier to use. So th the point is, though, this process, Mac, Windows, Laptop, Docker Compose, uh, with a relatively small number of containers that you're going to have day one, actually works out pretty darn well. Uh, it's basically fine. Uh, but as I said, there's this constant trend toward adding more and more containers. Um, and unlike in production where we can easily expand the amount of RAM and CPU allocated to those containers, uh, the amount of RAM and CPU on a laptop is finite. Um, and uh, also subtly, um, if you think about it, uh, unlike in production where Basically, all of the resources of a particular service can server can be allocated toward the the processes running on that server. On a laptop, uh, the containers that you're running for development are actually competing with a whole bunch of other stuff. So you've got uh, HyperKit and WSL um, on on if you don't know what those are on Mac and Windows, Docker um, actually runs inside of a virtual machine. Um, so in Mac is called HyperKit, when it's called WSL, um, and that virtual machine, I mean, it's a full VM and it has uh, RAM and CPU requirements on. On Mac, I think it defaults to something like two gigs of RAM. Uh, you've got your, your code editor, VS Code, you've got your browser, you've got Slack, you've got Spotify open. All of these things take up memory um, and they reduce the amount of memory that your containers have to run. And furthermore, if your containers are overloading the system, your containers are going to impact these other processes that you need to, to be productive. So what happens is everything's good. Number of containers increases. Um, your laptop has kind of headroom and can run the containers. But eventually, you hit a point uh, where the lines cross. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, the amount of containers that you need to develop your code exceeds what your laptop can comfortably um, handle. And this uh, causes the collapse of, of a performance collapse on your laptop. And basically, everything grinds to a halt. Um, and it's a major, major, major productivity drag for, for teams once they hit this. They see, uh, obviously, little stuff, reduced battery life, fan noise, not, not the end of the world. Um, but the big problem is things just get really slow. Um, the build and test uh, loop for a developer where they're like writing their code, building their code, running unit tests can kind of grind to a halt, take a long time. Um, and some of those ancillary processes um, that might be running on your laptop can also slow down a lot in a way that's rather annoying. Your, your editor slows down, your browser takes five minutes to boot, um, etc. So, uh, and I assume most of the audience at DockerCon is developers, but uh, for those of you who aren't a developer, um, I, I can tell you as someone who, who codes frequently, uh, you know, it might not like sound a, like a big deal for um, the time it takes to build your code to, to increase from five seconds to a minute or two, but you have to realize that as a developer, you're doing this over and over and over again, all day, every day. Um, and it's, it's a major distraction. It's really, really painful. It's probably the number one thing in my experience that drains my productivity as a programmer when my, um, when my coding environment doesn't feel kind of fast and snappy. Okay, so <clears throat> just to summarize, things start off small, everything's good, number of containers increases, performance on the laptop collapses. So what do we do about this? There are really only two things you can do. Um, you're not going to shrink the size of your, you're not going to delete features to make the development uh, faster. So um, the, the two options that we see people do 
are uh, mocking and they move to remote development. So first, mocking. The, the basic idea with mocking is we take some of our dependencies that are containers, we build a software library uh, that's designed to mimic the functionality of that dependency container, um, and we run our code against that software library instead of the actual container. Uh, so this is a standard kind of best practice that uh, people have been doing for a long time. Um, uh, and, it, and it works. It, it, it will sort of uh, reduce the, the memory consumption in development for, for your developers. Um, in my experience with mocking in general, there are some things that are really easy to write good mocks for, some things that are really hard to write good mocks for. Um, it's almost always worth it to do it for the easy things. Um, but it's very rare, it does happen, but it's a very rare, uh, in my experience, to run into a company that has successfully um, moved all of their dependencies to purely 100% mocks um, and had, had kind of good experience with that. Um, uh, what ends up happening is you, you mock out the things that are easy to mock and it slows down this process of needing more and more resources. Uh, but it just delays the inevitable. It doesn't. Um, uh, it doesn't sort of uh, fully solve the problem. The other option is to uh, do your development not on your laptop but in the cloud. Um, and this is what almost every really, really uh, large company with a lot of resources that's been doing containers a really long time, um, this is where they end up, uh, at least the ones that, I, that I've talked to. Um, so they'll, they'll give every developer their own EC2 instance in Amazon's cloud. Uh, you'll see people build out custom kind of cloud development solutions that, that, that uh, abstract away a lot of the the effort required to do this. Um, so I, this is really like the inevitable solution to the problem. You're gonna have to run your development in the cloud. The problem with it is it, it does require a pretty significant amount of setup work. Um, the really slick solutions, uh, you know, I'm not gonna name any names, but uh, I, I'm imagining a couple of companies I run into that have four or five person teams building out a cloud development container solution for them for their for their engineering team, developer productivity team. Um, and you know, they spent six months to a year building it and then full time maintaining it. Um, so uh, and it's worth it to them and they're getting a lot of value out of that. Um, but it's not something that's necessarily accessible. Uh, uh, to the companies that, the, to the engineering teams that don't have the resources to 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 spend that um, amount of effort on it. So that's actually why we built Blimp. So the idea with Blimp is we want to make it really easy for teams to develop with containers in the cloud um, uh, without the massive engineering overhead required to to uh, pull that off. So Blimp is pretty straightforward. It's just Docker Compose in the cloud. It's a drop-in replacement for Docker Compose. So where you would have typed Docker Compose up, you type Blimp up instead. Uh, it works with your existing Docker Compose.yaml file, so your existing config file. And instead of booting the containers on your laptop, they boot uh, on a Kubernetes cluster in GKE. Uh, it's a brand new service we launched it about, uh, well, by the time you're seeing this video, it would have been about a month ago. Um, uh, it's an alpha, um, it's, it's relatively stable, um, and it's ready for you to test, uh, but we're still kind of actively adding features and fixing bugs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, you can try it out at kelda.io slash blimp if you're interested. Um, three kind of key project goals for the software. Uh, we wanted it to be light and fast. So the whole point of this thing is to uh, make developers' uh, development environments faster. So if the tool is really heavy, like that doesn't work. Um, 
we want there to be zero setup and config. Um, it's very popular in the container space. You see all these new projects that come out and I'm guilty of, of having done this once or twice in the past. Um, uh, a new project will come out and it has all these great benefits and like step one is learn this new domain specific language to configure it or, or this new kind of YAML file format or whatever. Um, a key goal with Blimp is you, there is no config that you have to learn. You take your existing Docker Compose file and it just works. Um, and then it's not only enough for the Docker Compose file to just work, but once the containers are running, the, the experience using them has to be exactly the same as it was when running locally with Docker Compose. So we don't want you to feel like you're having to learn a new tool. Um, so things like localhost, things like volumes work exactly like they did before. Um, for those of you who've been kind of dealing with Docker for a really long time, you might remember in the early days before, um, before Docker Desktop existed, there was a tool called Docker Machine. Um, it's actually still around. Um, and the way you would do Docker development on your Mac is you Docker machine to boot a VM uh, on your laptop or in the cloud. Um, and the, the, the big problem with Docker machine was it, it could boot your containers, but then the experience of using your containers was quite different, um, particularly around things around how networking work and volumes worked and stuff like that. Um, and the usability as a result wasn't, wasn't that great, uh, which is why they built Docker desktop, um, which is, is much better. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do now is drop into a demo. Uh, so this demo is a really simple Node.js MongoDB application. Uh, actually it was, is built by scotch.io. Uh, so credit to them. Um, and all we're going to do in this demo is we're going to boot the uh, boot the doc, boot, uh, we're going to get the Docker compose file. We're going to boot it on blimp, view it, make a code change, etc. Um, the demo I'm going to do isn't like a special thing I created just for this talk. It's, it's, uh, publicly available. So, um, I'd really encourage you to actually follow along during the talk. Uh, if you go to kelda.io, slash blimp slash demo. Um, that'll take you to a page in our documentation, which is the page that I will be um, uh, running the demo off of. Go to keldo.io slash blimp slash demo. Um, and if you're following along, um, you can do the same. And here we've got, um, here we've got the code of our demo and the instructions for getting it set up. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually clone the demo repository. So I just copy and paste. And then the second thing I'm going to do is install Blimp. Um, we typically recommend uh, that you use this curl command because um, it works on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, I'm a homebrew user, so if you're on Mac and prefer homebrew, this brew command works as, works as well. So that's what I'm going to do in this case. But either way, you just copy and paste the instructions that you want and go from there. So for me, um, I've already got Blimp installed because um, I use it frequently. Um, so for you, this is going to take a little longer because it needs to download the, the command and install it. OK, so that's the, the setup. What we're going to do is actually boot this Docker Compose file, which is in that node to do repo. It's pretty straightforward. It's got uh, two microservices. Web is a Node.js service. It uses Nodemon to monitor um, the code for changes and restart the app. It forwards localhost 8080 into the port, into the container on port 8080, uses depends on, and then it mounts a volume. So the next step is to create an account with Blimp. We just run Blimp login to do that. 
uh, you can sign up here to make an account if you want, or just log in with your Google or your GitHub account. I'm, I'm logged in. And then uh, instead of doing Docker Compose up, which interestingly won't even work on my computer because I don't even have Docker installed. Um, you can have Docker installed, I just don't. So instead of doing Docker Compose up, uh, you run blimp up to run the Docker Compose file. So what this is doing is it's allocating for me a sandbox in, in the cloud. It is uh, creating my containers in those sandbox, and then it's setting everything up, the volumes and the, the networking, so that that sandbox is accessible from my laptop in a way that feels local. So now that we have this thing, what can we do with it? So I'm gonna full screen the terminal. So we can see the status of our containers. We can log into a container and look around. Uh, we can get the logs of a container, etc. So there's kind of the table stakes command line stuff that you would expect. Um, and then we can interact with our containers just like we would if we were using Docker Compose normally. So for example, as you remember, there's a port forward um, in the Docker Compose file for port 8080. So let's go ahead and visit localhost 8080. And you'll notice that um, our to-do application is available over localhost. Um, if I add an additional to-do, you'll see that um, you know, when I make requests, the, the web container running in the cloud is noticing those requests and then, and then responding to them. The way this works, by the way, is when I hit localhost in my browser, the browser is actually making a connection to this process uh, running in the terminal. And then the terminal encrypts that um, and doing an HTTP2 connection and shoves that off to the, to the running container and kind of handles all that transparently. Yeah. Okay. So then the next thing I want to do is show how with Nodemon um, running in the Docker container, you can use volumes to make a code change. So I'm going to navigate to the code and in the Docker compose.yaml, you'll see that we mount the, uh, the current directory into the container at user source app. So when you actually mount something from your laptop into the container, uh, instead of being a traditional volume, what, what Blimp does is it automatically converts that, converts that into code syncing using a, a, a tool called SyncThing. You can think of it as like um, rsync, but a little bit more advanced. So what this means is I can actually edit the code locally using any editor like I normally would. So if we go down here um, and uncomment this line, and I haven't saved yet, so when I save, watch the logs on this side of the screen. So three, two, one, save. And you'll notice that the file changed locally. That file change got shipped under the running container. Um, a process in that container called NodeMod noticed that the file change and restarted. Um, and all of that happened within the course of, of a second, right? Um, and all of that happened with just the standard Docker Compose YAML without any particular um, edits to it or anything like that. So if we go back to the application, you'll notice when we reload the page that our code change occurred. So uh, the implementation, there's actually two Kubernetes clusters on the back end, a, a control cluster, which is what you access when you log in, uh, does user management, it actually creates your, your sandbox. Um, and then the sandbox cluster where uh, the, the sandbox is actually run. Um, each sandbox is an isolated Kubernetes namespace. Uh, we configure network firewalls so that 
uh, containers can't talk to each other. Um, and we kind of follow best practices to, to make sure that those are really locked down to be secure. Um, all of your containers run on a single VM. And um, we mostly do that so, uh, so we don't have partial failure. If one VM dies, then you know, one person's containers will be infected rather than affected rather than having everyone's containers affected. Um, so you run on a single VM. Um, on the on the cheapest tier, you might share that VM with other other users, and again, we do our best to 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 make sure that you're you're isolated. Uh, but we are adding more expensive tiers where uh, you, you'll really get a dedicated VM, and no one else's stuff will be running on it. Um, <clears throat> for volumes, we use sync thing. Uh, we we considered literally mounting an NFS volume into the cloud. Um, but we actually noticed that a lot of people com complain about the performance of volumes, even with uh, Docker running locally. Um, and we thought the performance of doing NFS uh, over the wide area would not uh, be good enough. So uh, what SyncThing does is it is it notices changes in the local file system um, and then ships those containers off to a container running in the um, in the sandbox. Um, and, it, and it works pretty well. It's a little bit different, but it works pretty well. Um, uh, and then the way the local host tunneling works, uh, your browser makes a connection directly to the CLI. And then the CLI actually tunnels the TCP connection that your browser made over gRPC. It's over the same gRPC connection that the rest of the communication between the CLI and the cluster is, is occurring over. Um, so that gets tunneled over gRPC to the to the to the sandbox cluster, where it's kind of unmarshaled and sent to the right right container. Um, one bit uh, that's particularly interesting is the parsing. So uh, uh, we actually wrote our own parser in the beginning of the project, and then luckily Docker came out with a new uh, uh, reference specification for for Docker Compose, which was great for us. Um, and part of that, they wrote a Golang parser for v3 of, um, of Docker Compose, which is awesome. Um, it works really well, basically flawless. Um, so that's great. Um, interestingly, uh, a v3 parser is, is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, the first, um, again, we're, we're translating from Docker Compose to Kubernetes. Um, and there, there's another project that does this, by the way. It's called Compose with a K. Um, it, it gets you about 50% of the way there. Um, like it will kind of get the YAML most of the way. Uh, the problem is there's actually a ton of really subtle differences in how Kubernetes works and how Docker Compose works that required a lot of code to paper over. Uh, little things like how volumes are initialized, uh, things like depends on, the way health checks work, all that sort of stuff um, was quite a challenge to kind of get get there. And the second issue was uh, compose spec is a v3, Docker Compose v3 parser, but most Docker Compose files out there still are probably v2. Um, and we wanted to support both. So we did have to write some additional parsing code to kind of make that work. Um, future work, we're going to add uh, a bunch of collaboration features so you can get a, a public shareable link to your code that you can share with coworkers. Uh, um, or debug snapshots, things like that. Um, VS Code integration, uh, uh, CI CD integration. So imagine being able to run a full Docker Compose on every pull request and do end to end tests on that, uh, plus developer previews on every pull request. Uh, and then we're starting to work with a couple of um, companies on a, uh, on a team and enterprise edition that'll give you a little bit more control over. Uh, where and how this stuff is run, additional enterprise features, and we're going to have an on-prem version of the software as well. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for listening to the talk. Uh, obviously, you can check Blimp out at kelda.io. We have a DockerCon specific page, kelda.io slash DockerCon 2020. Talk recording and slides. Uh, I'm doing a webinar in, in about two weeks after this. This, this shows on uh, uh, common mistakes when doing Docker Compose files. 
Um, and also just a, we're, an experiment we're doing just for DockerCon, I'm just gonna put a link to my calendar up. Um, and if you wanna talk about Docker Compose, problems that you've had, things like that, um, or really anything, I'm available. Um, so thanks a lot.